And uh, appropriate credit, certainly for Parkinson's Resources of Oregon. Uh, Jess has done a, a wonderful job coordinating all of this. So please, uh, when you do have a moment after the presentation today, uh, please give your thanks uh, back to Jess directly, uh, as well as to those individuals that you normally communicate with at PRO. Uh, I wanna also uh, welcome our attendees in from Zoom. So we have about 75 people that are not in the classroom uh, with you here in person, but are also uh, virtually attending with you. So we'll be interacting with them a little bit throughout the day then today, uh, especially when it gets to Q&A, uh, because I'll be reading some of their questions for your benefit then as well. Um, okay, so I think we're ready to start off. And uh, I wanna give you an opportunity to understand what I would like to convey. So the purpose of the objectives here is, uh, I really want to make certain that you're aware that I'm not gonna just sit here and tell you or stand here and say, you gotta exercise, you gotta exercise, you gotta exercise. You've heard that enough and you've chosen to adopt exercise or not, but I wanna give you some background uh, behind exactly what the science tells us about how exercise does help and how the brain can change and how we can actually modify the disease of Parkinson. And then I'm gonna take it a step farther and uh, actually give you some different approaches toward what we actually would rather term physical activity rather than just exercise. Because those two can have two totally different connotations depending on your background. And the reality is we can prescribe the best program for all of you. We can do a thorough assessment but unless it's Have something that's done. personally relevant and Ordered. feels engaging to you, I wouldn't expect you to adopt it. So I hope to be able to help you with those things and in a very personalized manner today with the 110 people that we're essentially speaking to right now, I wanna help you beat your class of Parkinson's disease and maybe give you some insight as to the different subtypes of Parkinson's disease because there's not just one. So uh, on the timeline that we are going to cover today, I'll probably be speaking with you for about the next 50 minutes or so. And we're gonna be covering some of these topics and we're gonna talk about what is high intensity exercise? What does that mean? What do I have to do to make my exercise intense? We're gonna talk, as I just mentioned to you a few moments ago about the science of high intensity. And I'm gonna give you some videotape review along the way so that you can really see how this can be parlayed into something of your own as well. I do hope that all of you walk away with something that is personally applicable for you today, not just that you feel you know more about the condition, but you know more about your condition or the condition of those people you're providing care for. So I'm gonna make it very practical for you. And then as I mentioned here on the slide, as well as Jess mentioned, We'll do questions at the end as well. Please don't feel inhibited in interrupting me though. If you feel like you've got a question and would rather not try to remember it for the end, I don't mind being interrupted at any time. That goes for you uh, on, the, uh, on the Zoom as well. So good things do come from high intensity exercise. Um, let's find out a little bit about why. So this may look like a very busy and um, uh, an unreachable slide, but I can make this a little bit easier. What you're looking at is just a portion of the brain here. Uh, so you're looking at the main cortex. You can kind of think about that as where you do your thinking and where we kind of feel sensations and where we decide our actions. Okay, that's the cortex. And the cortex, again, is you might have heard of it called the, even the gray matter, and that's totally fine too. That's what we a lot of times think of as the brain where we store memories, not only memories about our movements, uh, but also memories about facts and events that have been important in our lives, okay? These areas here are basically the direct areas called the basal ganglia and they're closely related neighbors. That's all you have to worry about there. What's really interesting about all this is that these areas here, the SN, those are the substantia nigra. You guys have heard about those. Those are the areas that we'd like to say, hey, turn on the water faucet and give me some more dopamine. But the water's a little bit tapped out, right? And because we don't get dopamine forward to all the different areas of the lawn, if you will, 
some of those areas of lawn look a little bit barren or the grass can feel a little bit dried and barely able to survive, right? But there are things that we can do. One of those is include ourselves in higher intensity physical activity to cause our brain to produce a little bit more water from the faucet. Again, I'm talking about dopamine. So that's one thing that we can actually work on right there to help us out. Additionally, you may be taking some dopamine replacement therapy. That helps to bring some of your neighbor's water onto your property so that all of your grass can be watered then as well. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the science here. I'm gonna expand this out to another area of the brain that you might not be as familiar with, right over here called the nucleus accumbens. Now, don't worry about remembering this name, but just know that this is the reward center of your brain, meaning if you do something that you think is surprising or good or worthy or challenging, tastes good, feels good, your nucleus accumbens is going to have dopamine delivered to it so that you feel a level of exhilaration about doing that. So perhaps when you join up with a group of people to exercise in a class, that might feel great to you because you're getting social engagement and you're doing something that you know is, is healthy for yourself. Your nucleus accumbens is being bathed with dopamine right then. And that's really helpful because then that causes you to become addicted to something that's also very good for you. Now, I wanna let you know there's a backside to this the nucleus accumbens can also cause us to be addicted to things that are not healthy for us. Sugar, gambling, alcohol, um, and even actually committing uh, illegal acts. So that would be shoplifting. People can be addicted to that, and that's where we find that to be true, an overactive nucleus accumbens. Well, let's get away from that scary part, and let's add one more area of the brain here before we move on. I'm going to add the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Now I'm gonna tell you here, don't worry about that name because I'm gonna make this super easy for you. That's your attention center. Attention, where we figure out what is significant and what to prioritize one of our mind's most precious resources, what's important for me right now. As you're walking your dog on your sidewalk, you don't necessarily need to pay attention to the fact that there's a red car 45 feet from you that's moving in the opposite direction. However, if there's somebody screaming outside of that red car, help, I'm being kidnapped, then your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex can say, I need to pay attention to that. But if you're walking your dog and it's a particularly blustery day and there's some branches down on the ground, maybe that's where you need to prioritize your attention toward the branches or the wet leaves. So your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, here's why it's important, guess what? Also requires dopamine. So if you find in your particular presentation of Parkinson disease or the individuals that you're providing care for uh, have difficulty with dividing their attention, I can concentrate on my walking and do fine. I can concentrate on dressing myself brushing my teeth, going up stairs and do fine. But once you start talking to me, I don't have enough attention to do both. Part of that is because the condition, Parkinson disease for some people is leaving some people with this area of the lawn unwatered while they're also trying to get water to this area of the lawn. And again, I'm talking about dopamine. So if you don't have enough dopamine to get your attention center healthy, viable, usable, you might have some difficulty dual tasking, okay? Dual tasking. So I can pay attention to my grandchild talking to me about her day at school while I'm also walking. That would be another example of that. Pay attention to my walking while I try to pull something out of my purse, my checkbook, my glasses. Those are common examples of dual tasking. Now let's take just a little bit more time to talk about neurophysiology before we get into the practical attributes here. You guys have all heard about the basal ganglia. I just reintroduced the basal ganglia and attached some other 
areas to you. I want to show you the relationship here. The nucleus accumbens sits right next to the basal ganglia, and they both communicate with one another so that when you do something rewarding that's moving, better chance of storing how to do that movement again in the future. Hey, that was important. That felt good. Hold on to that. So we hit the baseball, the tennis serve, the golf ball, like that again the next time. The reward center and the movement center have an association in that manner. Now, we have to also understand that the Parkinson diseases, plural, are not all the same. Some people have tremor. Some people take short shuffling steps. Some people have a difficult time holding their posture upright. Some people have involuntary movement that we call dyskinesias. And a lot of us have some non-motor changes, depression, sensory changes, sleep disturbances, gastrointestinal disturbances. Some people have presentation of pain or maybe even paranoia. So some of the, the main non-motors have to be relevant for us as well. And that's going to be significant as we progress on here. But first, let me give you an opportunity to understand the three main subtypes of Parkinson, Parkinson disease as we know them today. Okay, And this is continuing to evolve, but we think we know that there's one, and the most common would be tremor dominant. And we're going to call that TD in the presentation today uh, for just the abbreviations that you'll see on the slides. And then there's also, not my abbreviation, PIGD. And that's actually what it's normally referred to, postural impairment gait disorder. So that would be the presentation that you might have if you had experienced freezing of gait, uh, bent over or stooped posture, however you choose to refer to that, or you take some short shuffling, shuffling steps. Now, the dyskinetic presentation is that that you might most commonly recognize for people that have young onset Parkinson disease, like Michael J. Fox, uh, like Ben Petrick, who's a former catcher for the Colorado Rockies, Major League Baseball. So, you know, most individuals that have the primary dyskinetic version have it because they had young onset Parkinson disease. So now you can see maybe that's a slightly different disease. Now, it is true that a lot of people end up experience dyskinesias, involuntary movements of the head, arms, and legs, if they've been on levodopa or dopamine replacement therapy for a period of time, too. The science on that is really, really um, advancing right now, and there is some uncertainty as to whether everyone is bound to get levodopa-induced dyskinesia or it's actually just some people are likely to get it depending on how long they've been on it. And some people actually will never get it no matter how long they've been on dopamine replacement therapy. So there's a lot of individuality there. So now, what have I told you already? Disease specifics. Young onset Parkinson disease, YOPD. Earlier than diagno or they're diagnosed before the age of 50, a lot of times they'll have dyskinesia, and uh, many times uh, these individuals will have genetic tendencies, all right? A few other things there if you want to look at the rest of that, a lower rate of dementia. Now, the primary dyskinesias, you'll see what it looks like. I've got that described for you here. And then in each one of the next few subsequent slides, you'll see I'm adding some information in orange. The information in orange is just some bonus information. We're here at Oregon State, so I thought I'd throw that in orange to you, okay? You'll see some Oregon State reference uh, here and reverence as well as the presentation progresses. So that's just bonus information. If you feel like you can understand the information in black and you want to go a step farther, take the orange information as well, all right? So this is uh, the least likely and the lowest presentation of persons with Parkinson's disease, it's only about 10%. All right, the main one, 80% of people have tremor dominant Parkinson disease. Now I've given you the structures there and even by name, it's very obvious what tremor dominant can look like. Usually starts in one extremity, may go over to the other side of the same extremity, starts an arm, goes to the other arm, may start in right arm and go to right leg, 
may start in head, face, and neck, okay? And then finally, subtype two, which uh, is not very clear that individuals might be 40% of the people with Parkinson's disease have this because there'll be some overlap between the tremor dominant and the pig D here as well. But again, as I've already expressed, shuffling steps, stoop posture, higher frequency of falls is very important to remember here. Uh, the persons with pig D will be at much, much greater fall risk. And we also know that's true for people with Parkinsonism, or if you prefer to call it Parkinson plus, that's true as well. So I don't want to uh, extend further down the range of Parkinsonisms because it's enough to think about the three Parkinson diseases and put all this into a short talk as well. All right, now the anatomical subtypes here, basically here's a take home message for you. Persons with tremor dominant will be more likely to be responsive to, that means they'll benefit from dopamine replacement therapy than people with the pig D. So dopamine replacement therapy should not be expected to help the shuffling steps and the bent over posture as much as dopamine replacement helps tremor, okay? All right, our first uh, reverence and, and thanks for being hosted today here at Oregon State University, of which I'm an employee here, and I actually teach in the program uh, to uh, the students of physical therapy then as well. So what have we learned so far? We learned that Parkinson's disease is more than just about dopamine, because as we saw there briefly, uh, Parkinson's disease, especially the pig D, doesn't respond quite as well to dopamine and might actually respond to a few new classes of medication uh, that are coming along. And we also know that some people in time may benefit from surgery. Uh, now, remember, we're going to start talking about exercise in just a minute, a minute though, too. We also learned that Parkinson's disease is about more than just one condition. And we really can't apply one type of physical activity or exercise and expect that to be beneficial for everyone for two main reasons. Number one, as I alluded to at the start, that wouldn't be respectful for who all of you are as people, right? To say, George, you've got to ride a bike. Every single day, you have to pedal the bike as hard as you possibly can. But I might say to someone else, um, you know, dance is the best thing for you. Ping pong is the best for you. Pickleball is the best for you. Boxing is the best for you. Group exercise that does large movements and big steps and balance challenges is the best exercise for you. In reality, part of the prescription of what's best for you, always have to consider who you are. All right, so now I'm gonna take this science of high intensity exercise, and I'm gonna probably substitute that word exercise for physical activity throughout a couple of different key points, yes. So before you move on, my question is, um, who decided or what were the symptoms that young onset of PD is the line in the sand is fixed? Uh, that's a good question probably was dis discovered in my lifetime as 32 years as a physical therapist, but I don't know when or whom that decided that. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not certain about that, but um, it does appear to be a pretty clear delineator because there's a, a good gap in there where, again, for the most part, people that are going to get young onset Parkinson's disease, 26 to 50 years old, there's a nice gap in there where 52, 53, 54, 55, all the way to 68, where most people are not diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. If you were to look at a, at a, uh, at a, a figure with that, you would see that the, the far fewest people with Parkinson's disease are diagnosed in that realm right in there. Once you hit 65, 66, 67, 68, starts to tick up a little bit, 68 much more, 72 much more, 78 much more, on into there. So that's, I couldn't answer the question perfectly, but you do see kind of a gap decade or a decade and a half in there. So with that in mind, is there ever, or do I ask, um, the percentages of children having some of this 
And you're saying it doesn't really present itself. It doesn't. So here's why. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you at least this part, and then we'll, we'll progress on. It appears as though it takes about, on average right now, seven years for a person to carry the condition before the diagnosis is made. That's one thing. And then here's the most important thing is that it appears as though about 70 to 80% of the substantia nigra can be decayed before we can actually clinically detect that a person has Parkinson's disease. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a really exciting figure for me to share with you because this can be one of the most compelling figures for us to consider here today. All right. And I'll encourage you, if you have the handouts, come back to this slide. If you don't, you can either email me for the handouts for this, uh, Jess or whomever. We can get you the handouts if you want this slide. Let me take you through this. If you engage in high intensity exercise or physical activity that's exerting, that could actually be rolling, pushing a wheelbarrow that's filled with a little bit of resistance, um, you know, uh, a sack of feed for your chickens. Uh, that could actually be pulling your 65 pound dog along for a walk. That could be lifting your 35 pound dog up onto his grooming table several times. Physical activity that requires a level of intensity that's challenging for you is going to be what we're talking about. Now, we'll have to do that with enough dosage and enough minutes to make a difference, and I'll help you understand that. But stay with me here. If you expose yourself to higher intensity, more difficult physical activity, you can actually come right down here to the center and influence the speed at which Parkinson's disease is degenerating. That's number one, okay? Now, along the way, you'll get an indirect benefit because any other condition that you have directly related to Parkinson's disease or not will also benefit from your exposure to high-intensity physical activity. Let me explain. Your medical stability, you all know this, diabetes, high blood pressure, primary heart problems, problems of the vasculature system, cholesterol, atherosclerosis, breathing problems, actually all respond nicely to high-intensity exercise. You can actually reduce the amount that a comorbid condition, such as diabetes or asthma, can influence you. And the more medically stable you are, the more effective your dopamine replacement therapy will be, and the more your Parkinson's disease will be in well, con well control. Now, your mental health. You may or may not know that higher exposure to physical activity will reduce your likelihood of expressing depression, even if you have a family history of that. So when you engage in something that feels, again, healthy and full of wellness for yourself, you release serotonin. Many of you may know that serotonin is actually something that is given in a common collection of depression or antidepressant medications. Activity, high intensity activity, will cause you to release serotonin if you chose to engage in that physical activity. It doesn't mean, oh my gosh, I was chased by a bear, I'm going to release serotonin. No, it means if you wanted to get on the treadmill and act like you were being chased by a bear and you elected to do that, then the physical activity is something that is antidepressant for you. Now, fitness, fatigue, resistance. So that means this is a really important one to understand. One of the easiest things to do, especially for persons with tremor dominant Parkinson disease, is make them fatigue resistant. Now, many of you, if you have tremor dominant or if you are providing care for someone with tremor dominant Parkinson disease, you already know that the tremor is likely to come on more virulently and more easily if this individual becomes fatigued comes on earlier in the day when you don't have a great deal of fitness, or if you're stressed psychologically or cognitively. And one of the easiest things to do is to help someone become more physically fit to make them fatigue resistant so that fatigue-based tremor doesn't come on quite as early in the day. What about nutrition and GI function? You may know that your gut, and that's the medical term, 
moves better. We call it gastric motility. It moves better and it absorbs the food that you've consumed better when you've exposed yourself to physical exercise as well. Also, sleep hygiene. It's hard to find anyone who hasn't occasionally had some difficulty with sleep over the last two weeks, right? So sleep hygiene goes better when we couple it with physical exercise that is at least more than a half hour before sleep and ideally engages in some physical exercise almost in the first half hour to 45 minutes after they've woken up. Some easy things to do there. We'll talk about those. How about social engagement? Well, you could couple your physical activity efforts with your social engagement, rock steady boxing, cycling, ping pong, dance. We've talked about those exercise classes. You could do that, or maybe you go out for a hike in these lovely hills, mountains, and buttes uh, in the area as a group. Couple social engagement with physical activity. And finally, one that might feel a little confusing, I'll make it palatable, and that's self-efficacy. And that means I have some control over my health. What I choose to do will positively impact my outcome, my health, my longevity, and truly my health attributes. Self-efficacy means it's not all just happening to me. I have some choice in the matter. So the commonalities across the Parkinson's diseases that we just saw from that last slide are that individuals can have better outlook, less depression, more engagement, better fitness, less tremor, less fatigable, and here's the big one, all the way down at the bottom. What we're just now coming to understand is that the level of disability that people with Parkinson's disease have is only partially due to the disease itself. Part of it is due to our expectations of the disease. What we and other people around us, yeah, what we and other people around us expect us to be able to do can largely predict what we're going to be able to do. Oh, I've been told I have Parkinson's disease. Therefore, I expect myself to become frail, move slowly, become weak. That level of expectation is something that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you see that you have the ability to make some improvements, walk faster, get a little bit stronger, improve your fitness, reduce your fatigability, then therefore that becomes the self-fulfilling prophecy of I expect that I can overcome. Parkinson disease disability is only partially due to the disease itself. Part of it is due to our expectations. Okay? And that's where we have to debunk some of the myths. So a virtuous cycle of intensity, meaning on a regular basis, I do something that's physically challenging for myself doesn't have to involve going to a gym, doesn't have to involve lifting weights, doesn't have to involve a machine. I'm doing something that requires a higher degree of physical intensity for myself that will improve my attention, my strength, my endurance, my confidence. All of those things will improve. Now, why do those improve? How? Physiologically, can you slow the disease of Parkinson down just by physical activity? Well, it happens in two realms. It happens centrally at the level of the brain, and it happens peripherally at the level of the body. So you get gains from both directions. Your body becomes more fit. You become more strong and more powerful. Those are two different things. Become more endurant, fatigue resistant. And that helps you say, this feels good. I'm less depressed about my condition. I have self-efficacy. But centrally, the activity participation itself causes you to release dopamine, your own dopamine. We call it endogenous dopamine. Your body made it. Okay. It also helps you release a couple things that I have abbreviated there brain-derived 
neurotrophic factor. Don't worry about memorizing that, but BDNF is the way we say it. And that's actually fertilizer for your brain. Remember we talked earlier today about the fact that your brain can be considered a lawn that you do or don't get enough water to. Well, guess what? You also need fertilizer. If you expose yourself to high intensity physical activity, again, pushing tw twin grandchildren in a stroller, physical activity, going out for a walk where sometimes you try to walk briskly and then walk slowly, physical activity, pedaling that bike, lifting your dog up, raking your garden, weeding your garden, raking for 10 times, really digging into the ground hard and then raking a couple times soft to recover. Those are physical activity engagements that can cause you to release fertilizer for your brain. Brain-derived brain neurotrophic factor helps to improve the viability of that cortex that we talked about and also helps us to protect neuron health. We actually know that the very cells that decay from Parkinson's disease are responsive and become more robust when you expose them to physical activity. All right. So the neuroprotective effects that are helpful for us to understand is that these neurotrophic factors, brain fertilizer, can interfere with cell death. Remember the orange lettering, the orange font is meant to be kind of next level. If you already get the white level here, it basically says the survivability of very important brain centers is directly tied to my exposure to exercise. One more time again, thanks for hosting us here today. But again, remember the, the exposure to high intensity exercises creates a protection of the cells and also releases that irrigation, if you will, and also releases the fertilizer, three things. So what did we learn so far? We did learn these things earlier, right? You remember that. Now I'm gonna add one thing to it because this builds on what we've said. Medications help with some things, surgery with other things, but exercise appears to help most everything. Exercise helps the direct survivability, expression of the dopamine and expression of the fertilizer, all right? We also learned that we can both slow down the disease and in many cases, reduce the amount of medication needed. So how do you apply high intensity exercise to your type of Parkinson disease? Well, here's what you learned, right? So if we consider that we're going to now begin talking about high intensity physical activity, we know that in the end, I'm gonna say, the interventions, what my recommendations will be, will not be the same for all of you. So I'm going to give you some options, and I want you to look for yourselves here in these options, okay? Maybe your option is going to be power training, and that might be standing up from your couch as many times as you can in 30 seconds. A commercial starts playing, your favorite television show or game show is interrupted for a moment, and you try to find out how many times you can stand up and sit down while one commercial is playing? You're doing power training. If you went up stairs quickly, if you tried to uh, lift a suitcase up uh, onto a shelf briskly, and it requires a little bit of strength, that's power training. We think about that. You think about power lifting in the Olympics, all right? All right, you could choose instead to express your physical activity at higher intensity and higher levels through endurance training. And I've given you some uh, options here, and I'm not gonna insult you by reading those options to you. You can all read those. But many of you will have these machines available to you either at home uh, or in a gym uh, uh, or in a clinic that you belong to or attend therapy. In. Remember the most reachable application for endurance training for intensity is intervals. Work really hard for 10 or 15 seconds doing whatever you're doing, then work really easy for two or three times that amount of time. 
So I'm literally saying, sit down on a bike, pedal as hard as you feel that you can for 10 seconds. Now pedal as easily as you can for 30 seconds. Now pedal as hard as you can for 10 seconds. Now pedal as easily as you can for 30 seconds. And that can happen with swimming, walking, treadmill, elliptical machine, bike, arm cycle, doesn't matter. That's what's nice about this is that it's not one size fits all. It could be boxing a punching bag as hard as you can six times in a row, and then just kind of swinging your arms against no resistance for 30 times, and then going back and hitting that speed bag or the heavy bag six times in a row again. You could also do some what we call task-specific balance training. So you could put yourself in challenging balance positions with some degree of protection. I've got a bed behind me, a counter in front of me, a chair here, or another individual that can help to stabilize me if I've attempted to dose myself too hard. And you could try to take big steps. You could take a left turn, a right turn. You could take a couple steps while you're taking high marches or closing your eyes. Sitting to standing and back down to sitting and back up to standing four times in a row with your eyes closed with a nice tall bed behind you, a chair or someone else in front of you, challenging your sense of balance in a task specific manner. But yet there's more options. You could actually try to work on balance challenges that require you to walk forward, walk backward, walk sideways. Maybe you do your balance challenge in expression of dance and follow a line dance with other individuals and follow a sequence or a pattern. Maybe you try to get into your hallway. Another really practical example. All of you could do this as soon as you go home. You could walk down a hallway that leads to your apartment door or in your home, and you could count the number of steps that you naturally take to traverse from the start to the end of that hallway. And then you know what you could do? is every single time you go down that hallway or some of the times, depending on what your addiction to physical activity might be, you could say, I'm gonna challenge myself. I know that I normally take 22 steps to get down this hallway, but when I do it for my own benefit, i.e. release an antidepressant for myself because I'm doing something that's helpful and healthful, I'm gonna to try to take not 22 steps, but I'm gonna to try to take 17. So how few steps can you get to the end in? And then you know you're doing something that involves some measurement and we call that gamification. You're making a game of health-based activities, gamification. And that feels energizing. And you know what else that does? When you are able to actually engage in those 17 steps, better than you used to do your 22 steps, you actually also release your own dopamine because you have a sense that you're doing something that is succeeding reward center, right? All right, you could also work on protecting yourself just to become less fatigable. We talked about that. And I will suggest to you that I'll put this slide up now but I'm going to give you some videotapes that further exemplify backwards walking and the benefit of backward walking. That's the retro specific gait training. You could actually just substitute the word walking in there. And you'll notice that sometimes when you're having difficulty in advancing yourself forward, taking a few steps backward, that your walking forward comes right back. So just some cues there. So, I'm not going to, again, insult you by reading this whole slide to you, but I could overwhelm you for an hour straight with the proven benefits of intense aerobic exercise. And I want to make it very tangible and reachable for you. Because if I told you, see Everett Koop, the Surgeon General back in the days that I was growing up, very familiar name to some of you, might have said that you need to participate in 30 minutes of continuous exercise every single day. And we all heard that, but very few of us listened to that because it felt like a lot of time. 30 minutes has to be devoted to continuous exercise every single day. Well, I'm here to tell you that the benefits of aerobic exercise can be found in eight minutes when you express it in high intensity interval training. 
10 seconds hard, 30 seconds easy, 10 seconds hard, 30 seconds easy, 10 seconds hard, 30 seconds easy. If I did a couple more of those, I'd made it to eight minutes for you already. Equally as, and as a matter of fact, for people with Parkinson's disease, more beneficial than 20 minutes or 30 minutes straight at a moderate intensity. Let me say that again. It is more beneficial for people with Parkinson's disease to get their dosage of aerobic exercise, making my heart and lungs breathe more, beat faster. More beneficial for you to do eight minutes of work hard, work easy, than it is to do 20 or 30 minutes of work moderate. Better for your body, better for your brain, better for the condition that you're dealing with. All right, so how can we actually pull some of these into reachable modes of activity? Well, you could do any one of these that I've got listed up here. Dancing, high-speed cycling, boxing, higher-intensity aerobics classes. And we actually have one of the area's most preeminent uh, exercise class leaders, Nancy Nelson, in the back of the room right here. She's going to raise her hand for us. So those of you on Zoom can't see Nancy, uh, but... She actually, I'm certain, would be available to be approached uh, at the end of the, uh, the presentation today as well. And she actually leads some of the exercises that I'm expressing right here on this slide. But that is an approach that is going to be something that she can help to shape, to reach you on an individual basis. And remember, the social engagement helps us from an antidepressant uh, uh, standpoint as well. Let me again reiterate some of the parts that I've, uh, some of the portions that I've made so far. You can help yourself at the level of the body, or you can help yourself at the level of the brain, disease modification, keep cell healthy in the brain, keep the fertilizer coming to the brain, keep the irrigation coming to the brain. So either way, you can help yourself in the top four or the bottom three, but I will tell you right here, as you recall, one of the most significant statements that I made to you is that a lot of the disability from Parkinson's disease is not because of the down here, what happened to my brain? I have Parkinson's disease. It actually happens up here. What happened to my body? Because I was told I have Parkinson's disease. So I stop doing things that require force. Stop doing things that require me to move quickly. Stop doing things that require me to endure or work hard. So it's actually called learned non-use. It's disuse. It's your body weakening because your body hasn't been exposed to the stimulus. All right. So now let's talk just very briefly. I already went through aerobic exercise. We could go on and on about the evidence of exercise to Parkinson's disease and just see the functional benefits, what you gain. But you all, again, have been very nicely exposed to this. You know my fall risk, right? My aerobic exercise reduces my pain because I release endogenous endorphins, different than dopamine. So did you know? that high intensity exercise exposure can help you release a natural chemical in your brain that suppresses the amount of pain that you will experience. That's called endorphins. But it helps us all to, all to notice that as well as the effects on the body, there are additional effects on the brain. Let's go all the way back to one of the first slides that I told you about the main attention center in the brain, I call the DLPFC, your attention center, or your dual task center. That's a short summary of what's done in that center. I'll give you some encouraging news to let you know that exposure to dual tasking, intentionally trying to keep myself balanced while I'm dealing cards, while I'm attempting to walk and listen to my grandchild, while I'm attempting to walk and manage my very busy toy uh, poodle, if you will, uh, taking him out for a walk. Dual tasking, when done safely and regularly, is a task that you can 
expect to improve. People with Parkinson disease, PWPD, can improve their dual task tolerance and capacity. So those are things that are frequently led in exercise classes as well. Here's another nice list of uh, options for you. If you see yourself on this screen, you see that many of these activities help you on an aerobic basis. And as a matter of fact, some of these very aerobic activities, walking on a treadmill with body weight supported treadmill training, a harness over a treadmill, working on open-ended games, joining a pickleball team or club, dancing and boxing, they also help with the next slide. They actually help us pay attention to the sequence of the dance steps. Pay attention to where the ball has gone, has gone in pickleball or where my partner is standing on the court. And that actually helps us because now I'll give you one other piece of information. And I will tell you that dual tasking not only helps with your physical attributes and your tolerance of distractions, but it will help you purely on your capacities to cognate, to think, to remember. So dual tasking, as a matter of fact, has now been scientifically proven to be superior to cognitive stimulation alone. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is rather than doing a crossword puzzle or by doing an activity, a Sudoku uh, or luminosity um, or um, a New York Times puzzle or Wordle, rather than doing those or instead of uh, or inclusive of doing those things, if you enjoy them, that's great. That working on dual tasking helps cognition more than a cognitively strategized dosage does by itself. Okay. So now I already told you that moderate intensity exercise is not superior to brief high intensity exercise. And this, these studies, many of them express that. Now, some of the commonalities that we should be aware of is that high intensity exercise helps all of the subtypes of Parkinson's disease. All of the subtypes of Parkinson's disease also can benefit from more strength. No one ever has too much strength. And task specific balance exercises that you're having difficulty with. I'm having a hard time changing direction. I have a hard time balancing when my eyes are closed. Those benefit everyone. But let me tell you, across all the people that I've ever worked with, which is literally thousands and thousands of people with Parkinson's disease over the last 32 years, there's really no substitute for engagement, feeling like I'm having fun while I'm doing something that also offers me a degree of wellness. So let's also remember that combining personal interests, this, I wanna do gardening. We can find a way to get your physical activity in gardening. I want to play with my grandchildren. I need to take care of my dogs, my chickens, my sheep, my cattle. We can find a way and any good healthcare provider, regardless of whether that's a personal trainer, a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, a speech language pathologist, or your physician, anyone that is a caring medical provider should be astute enough to be able to listen to you, tell them your interests, and figure out a way to give you an expression of higher intensity physical activity that fits with your interests, okay? All right, and again, for a final time, again, acknowledgement to my employer and also our host here today, and Go Beavers who won again yesterday in football. All right, so what have we learned so far, right? Here's what we learned so far. You've already seen these. Let's add something to that. We continue to study, this is so encouraging. We continue to study, learn more, and do better in combating Parkinson's disease. Your condition is being funded, studied, and improved. And that to me is extremely encouraging and I'm glad to be a part of that. So let's take a moment and say, if a picture is worth a thousand words, let's go through a couple videos. I'm gonna show you some things here with disclaimer you're going to see some things that look a little bit challenging. 
If you are averse to watching people be challenged, please don't watch these videos, all right? So here's a patient that I worked with years ago who had difficulty because he was leaning over. Right as you can, Larry. Walking. And what I'm doing with him is I'm actually tying him down with a cord. Okay, and Peter, I'm can you give him just a couple more MPH there? Onto the treadmill. And he We're going to put the speed on you for just a moment, Larry. While he's walking. So, so go we actually eight, if you do would. this to people and we take their most difficult problems and we exaggerate them so that they have to work against them. Here's a gentleman who's working on God, trying to walk backwards, 40 pounds yes. backwards as he walks backwards. Weight. So he has a I belt to, to, to a regular machine that you will see across stride. many gyms. One of those okay, gyms that has just a little pin that you put here. right inside between the plates that you want the machine to lift up. And he has to walk backwards, holding that and pulling it back. And he has to keep him keep himself from being accelerated back towards the machine. You'll see the line. So watch this, he's pulling it back. And rather than feeling Slowly like some of you express and some of you experience, I feel like sometimes I have to run to catch up with myself. We're making him do that by pulling him forward with 40 extra pounds, and he's retraining his brain and his body to be able to slow that down against the extra load. But also, you guys are very familiar with Parkinson's disease boxing, so I'm not going to show you a full video on that, but the social and cultural networking that happens with some high intensity and taking out some anger, maybe that's your best express expression as well. But let me tell you something else that you guys can do for yourself, okay? You could go lean up against a wall more than your arm's length away from the wall. So you can just barely touch it with your fingers and then step back a little bit. And you could do some wall push-ups. Watch what he does here. That's power. If you don't have a wall in your home, you probably don't have a home, so you can't do this. That. that means you have an apartment, you have someplace else that you're living. I guarantee to you in the structure that you live in, you have a wall even in the tiniest of homes, right? Push off. Now watch what he did right there. He got a little balance challenge for himself. Imagine doing that in a hallway. There's another wall right back here on the other side where even if he staggers yeah, backwards a little bit, ride, still you're make sure that you don't actually That's easy for you to do. Uh, if you backwards. don't have that couch that you can do that 30 second sit to stand from when the commercial is playing, okay. you, have you a at least have a wall. One of the walls Two very, up, very low hanging fruit for you to use as options. Maybe you find a machine at your local gym where you can do a very, very light weight oh, oh. and you can do a leg press. Believe me, this feels exhilarating. It feels like fun. That's good, Jim. People feel like they're on a swing and he's just springing up here. He's only got 37 pounds on the leg press, but he's jumping. And the expression of power is healthy to his body and to his brain, psychologically, physiologically. He's fertilizing his brain, right? So really the potential for disease modification in Parkinson's disease has to consider that we're dealing with multiple conditions and every person is an individual. So now with that said, I have delivered a tremendous amount of information to you guys in the last 50 minutes that I've been speaking and I'm ready for your questions and plenty of interaction and discussion. Um, and as I want you to prime your questions, I remember uh, I'm going to look up in the chat room here for those 75 and more people that are signed up with this remotely. I will be gathering their questions as well, just so that doesn't seem awkward. I've got a question first for you, though. All right. What's the best physical activity for people with Parkinson's disease? It's whatever you like to do. It may be right here, weeding her garden. So I want you to reframe the word exercise into physical activity, make it something that's productive, make it something that feels healthy, feels fun, feels engaging, may feel social to you. I want you to remember, you don't have to consider physical activity as something that is a prescription for you regardless of who you are. Because I recognize being someone that was born in the 1960s, that being raised by parents that were born in the 1940s, 
Some people think that exercise is a very selfish thing to do, right? Right, right. And that's a generational concept. And we're growing out of that, but it doesn't mean that that generational concept is wrong. So if you think that exercise is something that's selfish, then I want you to think about physical activity that you can do with others and even for others. So with that said, I'll pause the uh, presentation right now. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, actually, I'm going to actually show you my contact information. I'll leave that up for a moment. And the first thing I'm going to do is grab a question from our remote audience. Okay. So question number one, what are some ways for us to improve the symptom of apathy? That's a great question coming in from uh, one of our remote attendees. Apathy. Apathy, first, let's define that. That means feeling a level of disengagement like you have very limited or no interest in initiating anything. I feel apathetic. So one of the best ways to do that is to use gamification. Is That's actually to debunk the notion that you don't have any self-efficacy. You can't do anything about your health. So why care about anything? Why do anything different at all? Because Parkinson's disease is going to do everything to me. But once you utilize gamification, oh, okay. Well, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease three years ago. Rather than this misimpression that I'm going to continue to get worse and worse and worse, and remember the, the trajectory of how much you might get worse can be largely foreboding by your expectations. Most disability is predicted based on your outlook rather than the disease. You actually take the opportunities to measure yourself. You go to a healthcare professional, physical therapist or otherwise, that's my bias because that's what I've been doing since 1991. And you say, I want you to do some measurements on me. And then I want you to make some pre prescriptions and recommendations for me. And then I'm gonna do some things that I feel are energizing and engaging for myself. And then I wanna come back to you and I want you to remeasure me. And if you have apathy, you, as any human being would, can absolutely not refute the notion that you have gotten measurably better from the first time you were examined to the next time. And you can actually measure yourself. One 30-second commercial. Sunday evening, tonight. Measure yourself. You may force it to stands. Next Sunday, an individual with apathy cannot argue the fact that they made six sit to stands in the same length of a commercial. One of the most humanly engaging things to do is to become addicted to watching yourself get better. So there's a lot of things that can be done to the body and brain that can help to combat that. And remember, exercise causes us when we choose to exercise, not being chased by the bear, but when we hopped onto the treadmill or the bike or went to the boxing class, helps us release serotonin, which helps to combat apathy as well, all right? So I'm gonna look for the next question here. Good, and then Nancy, I'll take your question next. You sent some wonderful information, and I know one topic that always seems to be something that we hardly touched on is meditation. Mm -hmm. And I have always been under the impression in order to get the most out of your exercise, Mm. Do you believe that? Or? Yeah, as a matter of fact, that is true. And we hadn't known that for certain for quite some time. But that is to say the best time for a person with Parkinson's disease that is on a dopamine replacement therapy or another form of medication is uh, when you are in your on cycle, on phase, or when your body is at its most capable. So that means the levels at which you can reach a higher intensity expression of exercise will just be that much better because your brain is optimizing what it can do in its interaction and messaging with your body when you have that optimal, optimal medication on board. But that's also true for optimal sleep, hydration, nutrition, uh, and obviously for the medication as well. There was another hand that was coming up. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
Yeah, as a matter of fact, and and this uh, again, I don't want to uh, give the misinterpretation that I am a sleep medicine medical practitioner, but there's a lot of things that we can do that can help our ability to get good sleep. And I can review some of the things in the literature about that. But then there's some also related things that can help us on our first few hours of maximizing uh, our day as we wake. One of the most uh, well agreed upon things is actually natural sunlight in the first 20, 30 minutes upon waking. Um, we release a higher degree of cortisol, our body warms up, natural sunlight is healthy, and then exercise within that next 30 minutes to hour upon awakening helps to release our dopamine, helps to um, be an antidepressant effect, helps with our mental uh, alertness. So as we all know, kids do better in school if they do some physical exercise beforehand. And we are not certain exactly all the different aspects of why it helps. Does it improve blood flow to the brain and therefore cerebral activity goes better um, or the other chemical things that I talked to you about? But for many reasons, it appears as though early in the day, higher intensity exercise appears to strengthen our performance through the day. Yeah. Yes. I'm very happy to do that. Yeah. So the question was define high intensity. Um, and thank you uh, for uh, reminding. The previous question was about getting sleep earlier or getting exercise earlier in the day. Uh, and then in this time, uh, we're talking about defining high intensity exercise. All right, so high intensity exercise and also the frequency of that. So high intensity exercise, uh, the very clear uh, evidence on this is having you work at about 70 to 80% of your physical capacity. If 100% is you getting on that bicycle and pedaling at 95 revolutions per minute, you can see the readout on that machine. Or 100% is you're all out one swim lap of 25 yards and you make it there in 50 seconds. Working at a sufficient or satisfactory dosage for high intensity, for all the benefits of it, is about 70 to 80% of your maximum. So if I can lift 85 pounds from the floor up to my waistline, I only actually have to engage in about you know, 65 pounds to be about 70 to 80% of that to be therapeutic. Now, you also asked a related question uh, where you said, how frequently do you need to do that? Well, there does not appear to be, to the limits of the body breaking down, my muscles need a rest break, my tendons uh, are getting too much. Remember, you never wanna start from no exercise to five days per week, so we have to keep that in mind. You wanna systematically get yourself in condition to the point where you can tolerate the full recommended dosage, never zero to 60 on that. With that said, we, we know that three times would be the ideal to be palatable, to be respectful for people's lives, and they don't want to be exercising all the time. But there's no harm in exercising seven days a week, especially if you engage in a variety. Oh, I'll do my biking twice a week. I'll go to boxing twice a week. I'll do my dance programming once a week. You can do, that's five days a week right there, and you can have some variety. That appears to be the best way to go there, too. So doing some sort of cross training with it. Yeah. But at the minimum, we would love to have three days a week there. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna scan here. How can we combat post-exercise exhaustion lasting for hours? That is a really great question there. So that one relates to potentially Nancy's question, exercising when you are in your on cycle. Okay, so being appropriately medicated and the other things that I related back when I answered Nancy's question, adequate sleep, adequate hydration, adequate nutrition, okay? And then the other thing about that comes back to this gentleman's question is that don't try to participate in too frequent of high intensity exercise or too much of it until your body is conditioned up to tolerate it. So start slowly. 
do four minutes of high intensity interval training of 10 seconds on and 30 seconds off as you're working your way up to it. Do it once a week, see how your body tolerates it. Then work up to twice a week, then work up to three times per week. So that's one of the best things that we can do to combat the post-exercise exhaustion by not overwhelming yourself. Also a question, can you, and this comes from online, but again, I don't wanna inhibit the rest of you here uh, and present to ask further questions. Can you summarize the information about high intensity exercise workouts? How much per day? We did that, uh, eight minutes, and how much per week? We did that, and I think we've covered that question because of your question uh, then here too. Eight minutes would be the minimum right there. If I were to say all of it and just summarize it down, I'd say eight minutes, three times a week of your most favorite expression of a high intensity exercise, 24 minutes per week. That would be the smallest that I could boil everything down to. Yeah. All right, looks like there's one more new question down here. Does having deep brain stimulation affect neuroplasticity? We do not know the evidence on this well right now, so I don't want to speak out of turn, but it doesn't, there's no reason that we should expect that it would. Please keep in mind, also related to Nancy's question, that the setting of your deep brain stimulator might need some adjustment if now you're actually giving yourself a little bit more um, exposure to physical exercise than what you had been doing before your deep brain stimulator was implanted though. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. And yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah, uh, I can. So I'm going to first reiterate the question. Uh, to those of uh, you that uh, maybe couldn't hear him or are attending remotely, this gentleman's expressing his own case where he's had a stroke and that may have affected the same areas that persons with Parkinson's disease uh, are affected. That is uh, not uncommon uh, to have a small, what we call lacunar stroke uh, in the basal ganglia. And uh, this is actually called a vascular induced Parkinsonism. If it's something that uh, that you continue to struggle with. If it was just a one-time stroke, then it's just a stroke in the basal ganglia, and it's called Parkinsonism, not Parkinson disease. If you had a stroke where your brain produces dopamine, therefore you couldn't deliver dopamine up to the basal ganglia, then you would have something that would be a different type of Parkinson disease. I know that I'm someone Oh, okay. Sure, sure. Yeah. So a lot of that happens when, uh, and he's talking now to clarify that it's more uh, diabetes related. It can cause some frailty to your arteries and capillaries as they become a little bit smaller, making it hard for you to get blood flow down to those very small areas in the intimate area of the center of your brain, the basal ganglia. Let's go back to your question though, because Carl, you asked about pedaling backwards and why that can be helpful. So we don't know why, but we do know that walking backwards and then walking forward appears to cause some um, regeneration. Pedaling backward and then pedaling forward does as well. Let me tell you what our suspicions are though. The basal ganglia is an area in your brain that stores your memories of how to move. And sometimes when you have difficulty accessing the basal ganglia or turning it on, you can do something that you uh, don't have stored in the basal ganglia, and that is the opposite of the normal motor memory. 
your brain has substantial motor memories for how to walk forward because you can totally put that in the background and start doing something else and continue walking, right? But walking backward doesn't include your basal ganglia. It's actually operated in another area of the brain for you, Carl, wasn't involved in your stroke. Pedaling forward is normal, natural. We've ridden bicycles since we were three, four, five, six, seven years old, and we don't know how we do it because it's a motor memory. But pedaling backward requires a different aspect of your brain, so therefore your basal ganglia that was affected doesn't uh, have the responsibility of pedaling backwards. Another area of, brain, of the brain got to take over that. Yeah, you're welcome. I want to see online here if I've got another question. I'll take your question and listen to it while I scan here. Um, what about weight loss and lack of appetite? Uh, talk to me. Clarify your question a little bit more. I'll do my best to answer. Last year, lost 10 pounds, and that's because the weight, and you eat a little bit, and I pull it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that is a little bit more difficult, and I don't want to pretend that everything can be solved through exercise. Um, are you already engaging in something that uh, does uh, require stimulating physical activity? Well, I take a while on the bike. Yeah. So you're doing what you can there. And have you sought counsel with uh, your primary care physician about appetite? Okay. Because there are certainly some medications that uh, I'm not well versed in and cannot prescribe. Uh, that would be um, appetite suppressants. And so again, for those of you attending remotely, um, her question was, what about weight loss that has happened precipitously over the last several months and years uh, and lack of appetite going along with that? And perhaps the lack of, lack of appetite causes the weight loss because it sounds you're, like you're a very active individual. So um, if you're already playing the card of exercise, and you're getting adequate sleep, then you may want to seek counsel on uh, getting on to an appetite suppressant. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, a, a, an, a, an, a, an appetite stimulant. A, appetite stimulant, right? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for catching me on that. So an appetite stimulant would be maybe something to consider. That's not my main area of expertise, so I'm cautious about going too far into that. I like to answer questions well that I know about, and then I'm careful about not answering those that I don't. We do have another question here online. What's a good way to measure if you're doing a high intensity workout? So that's a great question that's relevant for all of us. Uh, what we used to use uh, and can to some degree still use is a talk test. So if you can still hold a sentence, sentences, long conversation with someone, you're probably not exercising at a high enough intensity. So if while doing your higher aerobic pedaling, walking, um, weightlifting, dancing, boxing, you can continue an easy conversation with someone as though you would when you're talking on the phone, you're probably not at a high enough intensity. But remember, intensity is going to be relevant to you and you wanna start slowly in rebuilding that if you're just re-engaging in physical activity. We want you at about 70 to 80% of your maximum. And if you can hold the conversation easily, you're probably not there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I wanna make certain, uh, we have no new questions here. We've, we're good on time here. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Why is it so hard for me to stand up straight or walk standing up? Okay, and so one of the subtypes of Parkinson disease that we talked about is postural impairment gait disorder. That one tends to cause people to bend forward. Do you find yourself leaning forward or backward? Forward. Okay, I wanted to clarify that. She said, for those of you in the remote audience, why is it so hard for me to stand up straight or to continue staying up straight as you walk? Um, in 1992, when I graduated from physical therapy school, we used to think that everything that we could do for people with Parkinson's disease is just help with posture, have them do rotatory and rotational exercises and do back exercises to stand up straighter. What we have come since to learn is this, and this may be helpful to you. A common compensation for 
the act of feeling like I might fall backwards is to lean forward a little bit. And there is an apparent um, tendency for persons with postural impairment, gait disorder, Parkinson disease to have a misinterpretation of where vertical is. And when your vertical is off, you think standing up straight means I could fall backward at any moment. Well, what's the most natural human tendency if you felt like you were gonna fall backward? Let's say you were standing on a bus and the bus is getting ready to take off and there's no place to sit down, you're between airport terminals, then you're gonna lean forward a little bit or hold onto that bar. It's natural for you to lean forward if your brain thinks here is actually back there, just that much. As the condition progresses, if you're here and you still think now because the condition progressed, you're falling backward, then you lean forward more. So where you place your center of mass allocation of the collection or the equation of where your body is, is a function of where you think balance is. So now I'm going to come all the way full circle and answer your question. It could be that engaging in a medical relationship, physical therapist or otherwise, helping you retrain your balance can actually help you retrain where vertical is. And I actually have videotapes showing in fact that very thing in a two week standpoint, taking an individual that does this, no change and no medication, nothing else, working on balance training, helping her be this. One easy approachable thing that you can do so you have something palatable to take home is you might take a large book, encyclopedia, cookbook, et cetera, and you will put that book just under the toes of your feet, both feet, while you're seated at a chair or your bed. Your toes are actually up on that book. The book's on the floor. Your heel's still on the ground. Having your toes up in that book is going to tip you backward. As you stand up, your toes are already going to be up. Retraining yourself to be able to tolerate the backward position may cause you to be able to retrain yourself not to have to compensate forward, but to be comfortable with balancing yourself in the true upright that all of us see you're standing upright. Does that make sense? Excellent. There was a question back here. Yeah, I want to take yours now. Minutes you talk about is that the, I, that's, the part of the whole thing. that's the whole thing. That's a great question. So those 10 second segments surrounded by 30 second segments, that's 40 seconds. Having a hard time doing my math here, but eight minutes multiplied by 60 seconds is 480 seconds. If I've got 10 seconds plus 30 seconds is 40 seconds, that means you only need to do 12 separate uh, uh, of those because we've got 40 seconds multiplied by 12 to get me to the eight minutes, 480 seconds. I need to do 12 10 second high intensity intervals Wow, that's only 120 seconds. So inside that eight minutes, you're only doing two minutes of high intensity and you're doing six minutes um, for the other portion of that eight minutes of the low intensity. It doesn't mean stop moving. It means do the same movement at a lower pace. Guaranteed. Guaranteed? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm gonna guarantee that you have fulfilled what the science tells us. <laughs> But I know nothing about you particularly to guarantee that for you. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll take one more question. Carl. What is, what is a good way to measure your yes. interval 10 seconds and 30 seconds while you're doing high intensity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. I do a Mm -hmm. Is that the same thing? Depends on how familiar you are. Let's say if you were a world-class athlete or somebody that competed in backstroke, then backstroke is actually already in your motor memories and it's not something that would be accessed in a different part of your brain. So just the act of going backwards doesn't make it nuanced or novel to you because it may be familiar to you. And once it becomes familiar, your brain stores it in the basal ganglia. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah, and if it's not already familiar to you, remember, though, that even forward swimming, if it's not something that is well ingrained to you, is novel to you, and that means it requires contribution of areas outside of the basal ganglia. It doesn't matter that it's forward or backward. 
I want to thank all of you online. Uh, and I also want to thank all of you here in person because you helped to flush out some of the other nuanced information that I, um, I need to kind of expedite pass and speed pass to be able to get a lot of content pushed forward in 50 minutes. But you guys asked some very intelligent and brilliant questions. So thanks for, uh, for, for bringing that out as well. And I'll just uh, double check here. How critical is it to work with a physical therapist who's specialty, specially trained in neuro versus general? And I will tell you, um, again, my bias here is that when you have an individual that knows what to expect of the condition, then you have an individual who is not already um, creating some of these fallacies about, well, I don't know that much about people with Parkinson's disease, but th this person, I read this in their chart. So I think I'll take it really easy on them and exercise. And so therefore, one of the worst things you can do is go to someone for help, pay your copay, spend your insurance company's dollar, and never actually access truly what the science says. And that's where my answer would be. Uh, someone that knows the science, knows the expectations, uh, of what the persons with Parkinson's disease should be capable of. Can I just make a correction? Please do. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know very many people that have Parkinson's that go to see a physical therapist once a year. And I just strongly believe that if you haven't seen a physical therapist for your Parkinson's, you should be doing that. Initially, when you're diagnosed, you get a baseline evaluation and know where you are, and I was talking about the board, and then you work in your community with a person who can sure. work with your physical therapist and communicate. So when you go back to physical therapy the following year, you haven't gone like this because you've done nothing. Yeah. You've had PT. But I, I just really think the benefit of regular PT for Parkinson's, not because your shoulder hurts or your back heart hurts, but because of Parkinson's and then that for yeah. sure would be a And that's becoming the standard of care slowly to be actually be called the dental model of care. See that individual every six months or every year like you would the dentist. Uh, and that uh, what Nancy was expressing for those of you that might not have been able to hear uh, attending by Zoom, uh, she was espousing uh, the virtues of going to a physical therapist on a regular basis for the measurement, for the baseline, for the checkup, for the Parkinson disease specifically, not just for the other things that you associate that a physical therapist might be able to help out with. I'll take more questions in person afterward. I've got a few patients to see up at Spark Rehab that are due to see me at 1145, but they know I might be a little bit late too. Again, I wanna thank all of you that were attending remotely and in person, and thanks again to Parkinson's Resource of Oregon.